And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. These are prophecies of the end that Daniel is now being made aware of. Verse two, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is speaking of the resurrection at the end of the age. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. That happens at the same time, by the way, there are multiple judgments, there's one judgment. And in that judgment, in that resurrection of the dead at the end of the age, some are gonna rise to everlasting life, some are gonna rise to everlasting shame and contempt. Those who are wise at that time, verse three, shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. God has predestined you. He has determined beforehand that you will be adopted as a son. God made us alive completely by grace. He gave us a gift of faith, not of works. And this, what it produces, is good works. The Spirit leads, and the sons of God are those who follow. Set yourself apart to His work, His service, His kingdom, His word. To a life of increasing holiness. There's no, there's no room for passivity in the Christian life, is there? Our sermon title this evening is By Decree of the King. This is part two, By Decree of the King. We're looking at Revelation chapter 10, this section of text that runs from verse one to verse seven. And in our study of Revelation now this evening, we've been brought to, we've arrived at a consideration of the third of seven literary cycles in the book. This is the third cycle. Each of those cycles now, by way of reminder, recapitulating a single period in history, a single period in God's redemptive plans and purposes, namely that period that lies between the first and second advents of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the age in which we're now living. Uh, this is a period of time in which, we, in which we now live, the age of the church, this is the church age, the age of the church in her time of tribulation. Now, in our study of this cycle of trumpets, we've been looking at this period primarily so far from the perspective of unbelievers. Unbelievers are those who dwell upon the earth who are incurring the wrath of God. Judgments have begun to be, to be poured out upon these earth dwellers and they are those who have not received the seal of God on their foreheads. They're the ones who are now feeling the full force, if you will, of these judgments that are poured out upon the earth. And though the elect of God may turn in repentance, this unbelieving world, those not marked with the seal of God on their foreheads, this unbelieving world uh, in um, dovetailing with what we're talking about in Romans chapter nine, this unbelieving world is hardened they're hardened by the outpouring of these judgments. As we saw in the end of Romans chapter, or Revelation chapter nine, they would not repent. They rather harden their heart against God and further blaspheme his name. And that is further preparing them for their final and ultimate judgment at the end of the age. So we're looking at this from the point, from the perspective of unbelievers, those who dwell on the earth, and those judgments being poured out upon them, hardening them, preparing them, if you will, in the language of Romans chapter nine, preparing them as vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, their ultimate and final destruction. All of this pointing to that occurring at the end of the age at the return of Jesus Christ, where he will uh, judge the wicked at his appearing. Now, having looked at this time period then, from the perspective of unbelievers, from the perspective of unbelieving earth dwellers, we now arrive at a parenthesis. Okay, and not unlike that parenthesis that took place between the sixth and the seventh seal, this parenthesis takes place between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. The pattern is being repeated. And like the parenthesis that took place between the sixth and the seventh seal, that parenthesis shifted our focus, if you will, from those judgments that are being poured out on the earth dwellers, those judgments against the wicked uh, during this period of the church age, during this period of the church's tribulation, those judgments primarily focused upon earth dwellers, those that did not have the seal of God on their foreheads, our, shifted was, our focus was then shifted to a picture or symbolic representations of the church. Now that parenthesis between the sixth and the seventh trumpet now in 
Revelation chapter 10, Revelation chapter 11, essentially does the same. After chapter 10, where the apostle John is recommissioned to continue his prophetic work, we then see a depiction of the church, as we would expect in keeping with the pattern. And it's a depiction of the church in her work now, as the church militant on earth, her work as an enduring witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see the persecution that she faces as a result of that. So if you think with me about this parenthesis, in the cycles, the cycle of seals, now the cycle of trumpets, we're gonna see the same thing in the cycle of bowls. The emphasis or the perspective is primarily upon those unbelieving earth dwellers who are receiving, if you will, that, those judgments being poured out. And from that intensity, from that severity, from that difficulty, our focus is then shifted during the time of the parenthesis to take a look at what's going on with the church as it were during this same time period, right? And we're dealing with that time period between the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in this parenthesis, again, we see a picture of the church. If you remember from Revelation chapter seven, that picture in, of the church included the church militant on earth arrayed for battle, as it were, seen in the camps of Israel, the 144,000, um, that encampment to display the church in her wilderness wandering, in her wilderness, in the time of her wilderness testing. And then John turns, having heard them numbered, John turns and he sees, and what he beholds is the church triumphant in heaven, uh, the church arrayed in white robes, palm branches in their hand, worshiping the one seated upon the throne and worshiping the lamb. So in chapter 10, we come to this parenthesis where the same thing is essentially going to happen. We're going to see, as we get to chapter 11 in particular, a picture of the church on the earth. Now that parenthesis is meant to encourage us, okay? Um, the judgments that we see, and if we understand those rightly from what's being communicated to us in this letter, those judgments are devastating and they're terrifying, okay? Devastating judgments being poured out, a third of the planet being killed, a demon horde of locusts, a demon horde of hellish horsemen. These judgments are uh, fierce. And there's even now, as we've seen through this uh, consideration of the cycles, this linear progression of intensity and severity and frequency. Things ramp up like pains, birth pains on a pregnant woman. They get worse and worse and worse. They increase in severity and they increase in frequency. Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. In that circumstance, in that context, the church may lose hope. Right? We can get discouraged. We can be wearied by that. We, we see that increasing severity, that increasing frequency, that increasing intensity. We see that in our own day, don't we? Flip on the news for five minutes, okay? It's facing you. <laughs> it's coming on us like a, a barrage. And it's it, in that context, it's easy for the church, God's people, to become discouraged, to become weary in well-doing, to forget maybe why it is that we're here and what essentially we're doing here, what we're to be all about. Effectively, the church can forsake her first love in those circumstances like the church at Ephesus, referring back to those seven letters written to the church as an Asia minor, tolerating false doctrine in their midst like the church at Pergamos or Thyatira. Eventually, they may, come, may become a dead church, a church in name only like Sardis or lukewarm like the church at Laodicea. That's what those letters are about. The church in the time of her tribulation becoming discouraged, becoming weary in her tribulation, in her suffering, in her persecution, and becoming weary, the first temptation then is to compromise. And as we talked about, we saw that compromise in Sardis. We saw that compromise in Laodicea. Simply not willing any longer to step into the fray and to wage the good warfare, fight the good fight. We tend to forget we're in a fight, <laughs> right? We tend to forget what we're doing. And these judgments being poured out upon the earth and the response of unbelieving earth dwellers to those judgments should remind us. But at times we need great encouragement to keep us persevering. And one of the means by which the Lord preserves us are these encouragements in this parenthesis view of the church given in first Revelation chapter seven and now Revelation 10, Revelation 11. It's meant to encourage the people of God to persevere knowing, knowing 
that there is one who walks amongst the, lamp, amongst the lampstands, one who cares for us, one who is sovereign over all the affairs of history, the one who is bringing about all of his decrees according to his decreed will, one who is ruling and reigning, if you will. And it encourages us with, us with that picture as we are the church militant on earth, we can look to heaven and see that vision of the church triumphant. Surrounded by that cloud of witnesses, we are to persevere, persevere in well-doing. Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, and one little word shall fail him. We have the right man on our side, amen? The man, Christ Jesus. So, we're to look at this parenthesis, and we're to take encouragement from it. We must not compromise faithfulness to our commission. We are to maintain holiness and God's worship within, and we are to press outward with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for the sake of his name and for the expanse of his kingdom, okay? We cannot compromise in faithfulness to our commission. We are to persevere as a faithful and enduring witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in the midst of difficulty and suffering and tribulation and trial. But the parenthesis now, this, this look at the church, then in the encouragement that it gives the church is really like opening a window and getting in some fresh air, if you will. We've been looking at this, the, 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 the tribulation, the suffering, the judgments being poured out on earth dwellers. And in the midst of that, uh, this is like this uh, parenthesis to be like opening a window. It's like uh, letting in a breath of fresh air in the midst of this world's pollution. So the parenthesis is to remind us of how we got here. The church militant in battle array upon the earth through the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what it is that we are to be doing. We're to be preaching the gospel. Who it is that we're serving. We're serving Christ who walks in the midst of the lampstands. We are to remember that there is one who is now preserving us, who will see us through, who will preserve us until the end. And having sealed us as his own precious possession, we are to remember what he is preserving us for. We will soon be with the saints in glory. That great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. The church triumphant, dressed in white, palm branches in their hands. We should meditate on the reality of these verses. Certainly meditate on those judgments being poured out on unbelieving earth dwellers. But brothers and sisters, we have a heritage that we're celebrating too, that we're to remember, that we're to meditate on. We should meditate on the picture of the church here on earth, the picture of the church in heaven, and be encouraged that our God preserves us. Now to this point, in the parenthesis of chapters 10 and 11, we've considered now the identity of the mighty angel who will recommission John to write. Verses one and two, this mighty angel is none other than the angel of the Lord, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who comes in the clouds of heaven, a rainbow on his head, his face shining like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. Those pillars of fire, again, symbolic of his appointment as judge of all the earth, his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the sand, his voice roaring like a lion. This is a picture, verses one and two, of our conquering king. The Lord has a small book, a small scroll in his hand. We're gonna look more closely at that in verse eight. But for our purposes this evening, we actually see now a brief reference in our text to another cycle of sevens. And this is the cycle of seven thunders. Look at verse three. When he cried out, when this mighty angel cried out with a loud voice, seven thunders utter their voices. Now, when the seven thunders utter their voices, I was about to write, John said, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Remarkable, isn't it? This is a, a remarkable section of text in the book of Revelation here. John is writing, John has been commissioned to write what he sees and what he hears. So John immediately uh, does what he's been commissioned to do. The seven thunders utter their voices and John begins to write, but then somebody restrains his hand. There's a loud cry of this mighty angel and then these loud peals of thunder and yet then we're not given any content of any of the speech, anything that they say. But what we do see 
What we do hear and understand in this speech is the authoritative and revelatory voice of God. And that's what I wanna show you tonight. The one who is sovereign, the one who is ruling over the affairs of this age. This mighty angel whom we've identified as the Lord Jesus Christ, he cries out with a loud voice, verse three, and that's not unlike the, the voice that John heard when he was commissioned the first time. If you remember that from Revelation chapter one, verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet describing the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was saying, verse 11, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. What you hear in Revelation chapter one, and now what we hear again, uh, again, a repetitive pattern, if you will, what we hear again in chapter 10 is a loud authoritative, revelatory, prophetic voice from God. That's what's being communicated to us. In Revelation chapter one, when John was commissioned, in other words, John was receiving a prophetic commission from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and the Lord Jesus speaks with this loud, revelatory, prophetic voice that sounds like a trumpet. It was a loud voice that the, the volume of the voice, if you will, signifying his authority, but also signifying his power. And it's an indication of God's revelation, God's prophetic commissioning to write revelatory scripture, if you will. That was given to the apostle John in chapter one. And now he's going to receive this commission again. He's gonna be recommissioned now in Revelation chapter 10. Now there's examples for that in scripture. We see several of them in the Bible. And it's reminiscent in particular of the people of God gathered around Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20. Think with me, I want you to listen. Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, and listen to this description of the context there. Verse 18, all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. Now, if recall that event, if you think about that event, it's deafening. Right? There's this blast of the trumpet. Lightning is flashing, thundering, deafening. What's about to happen? God is about to come in power and reveal himself to the people. All right? When the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. They were terrified. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us, Moses, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. That's how terrifying, how loud, how authoritative, uh, how powerful his voice was. Not simply an indication of God's power though, but also an indication of his authority, an indication of the righteousness of his judgment. There's so much communicated in the force of that loud, authoritative, revelatory, prophetic voice, right? Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 18 describes that particular scene in a very interesting way. Listen to this from Hebrews 12, 18. He says there, for you've not come to the mountain that may be touched uh, and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and temp tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight. And we might even add, so terrifying was the sound that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Moses was the one who had been speaking with God to face, face to face as it were at the tabernacle of meeting. And even Moses was quivering in his boots, his knees knocking together. Moses was exceedingly afraid and trembling. But that revelatory, authoritative, prophetic voice, specifically described in our text as the voice of a lion when it roars. Explained that way in Revelation 1, explained that way in Revelation 5. Explained as the voice or described as the voice of a lion when it roars is best seen as a reference to Amos chapter 3. Turn there with me to Amos Amos chapter three. And I think John's words here, again, John goes back repeatedly 
repeatedly to the text of the Old Testament to inform his understanding and frankly to inform his writing of Revelation. Revelation is the capstone of the canon. It has its roots in Old Testament and even in New Testament Revelation. So here John goes back to Amos 3, where in verse 7, the prophet says this, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So the Lord, everything the Lord does, the Lord reveals to his prophets. He is giving his revelatory, authoritative, uh, prophetic word to his servants, the prophets, and his prophets are to proclaim his word, okay? But what is it like when God gives his revelatory word, as it were, and commissions prophets to write? Verse eight, a lion has roared, right? Do you see that? That's an expression of God's power, God's authority in giving his revelation. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? That's a rhetorical question. Nobody will be without fear, (laughs) right? Uh, Don't speak with us or speak with us, Moses, so that God doesn't have to. If God speaks with us, we're going to (laughs) die. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? In other words, what, what is being established in this recommissioning of John in Revelation chapter 10 is this connection between the lion of the tribe of Judah and this voice of a lion roaring, this thundering, powerful, we could say omnipotent, prophetic, revelatory, authoritative voice from God connected with his commissioning of his prophets to preach his word. And that forms a picture, if you will, now that sets the context for John's recommissioning in Revelation chapter 10. John is going to be recommissioned to preach the word of God. And so God comes forth in power, just as he did at Sinai, to convey this revelatory word to John and to commission his prophet. What the Lord has decreed, what the Lord has determined to fulfill in time, he reveals to his prophets. So really, in Revelation chapter 10, John is being commissioned as a prophet of God. He's being commissioned as a prophet. That revelation, the revelation given to Amos, as it were, the revelation given to John, the revelation given to Moses, that revelation is given with supreme authority. There is no higher authority. It is an expression of divine omnipotence, the power that will be employed to bring that word to pass. In other words, this is not some, you know, limp-wristed, weak, soapy, sentimental, sappy message that's being delivered. This is a, a message that's being delivered with divine authority, and it's backed up by divine power to bring it about. So as John is recommissioned to write then, he's going to receive further visions of the time of the end when these judgments are being poured out, the time that we're now living in. What's being communicated there? is that this is a decree of almighty God for the end. What John is going to write, what John is going to reveal for God as God's prophet are gonna be those judgments that are decreed for this age. Those judgments are going to be poured out. That word is given to us with supreme, uncompromising authority. And there is omnipotent power behind every single one of them to bring all of those decrees to pass. Not one of them will fail. Do you see? It is revelatory power, revelatory authority that's being conveyed in the commissioning of John and that describing the way that the Lord will bring to pass all that is written uh, in the scroll in the little book that John has given. The Lord has spoken, Amos says, who can but prophesy? John has to speak the things which he has seen and heard. Well, in Revelation chapter 10, John is the one who will prophesy. He is the prophet. John will be the one commissioned to further proclaim the prophetic word of the Lord. That is reiterated if you look at verse seven, Revelation chapter 10, verse seven. In the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he, the seventh angel, is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. Again, whatever God does, Amos 3 He reveals his secret plans to his servants, the prophets. His prophets prophesy and God fulfills what he has spoken. He has revealed what he's planned for this time of the end to his prophets. John is one of those prophets and John is going to write. Look at verse 10. 
Then John, he took the little book out of the angel's hand and he ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, John says, but when I had eaten it, 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 my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So what is this? This is a recommissioning of God's prophet, the apostle John. This loud voice, the voice of a lion when it roars, an indication of God's authority, authoritative, revelatory, prophetic voice. Now, when the Lord cried out, John hears in verse 3 then, Revelation 10, 3, when the Lord cried out, John hears seven thunders utter their voices. This voice of the mighty angel, which we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, promotes or provokes, if you will, this uttering of seven thunders. Not unlike, if you compare this, what we're talking about, again, we're talking about the divine, omnipotent, revelatory, authoritative, prophetic voice of God. So these thunders, they thunder their voices, not unlike the peals of thunder that boomed that day at Sinai. If you've ever experienced that before, I remember I was thinking about a, an example of this. I remember once uh, standing at the front door of someone's house. We're standing at the front door of their house and lightning struck uh, just at the end of their front yard <laughs> while we're standing at the house. That lightning strike was literally, it was precipitated by the hairs on the back of my neck. <laughs> like, going like You felt it before the lightning actually struck. It was a crazy experience. It struck the telephone pole. It was just at the, the front of their yard. The flash of light was blinding, but at the very same time as the flash of light was the crack of thunder. And the crack of thunder was deafening. Like it was, I, it was a remarkable experience. Just this crack of lightning, this peal of thunder right just across the yard from where we were, were standing. Here in verse three, the word is laleo. The deafening sound of the thunder was expressed in speech. That's what that word means. The thunder spoke. It was this deafening Mount Sinai-like thunder uttered, and it utters speech. John heard words. He heard words, okay? Verse four, and when the, the seven thunders uttered, it's the same word, laleo, the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, John said. So John heard words. He was going to write down the words that were said. These are thundering, booming voices expressing speech. Again, what is this a revelation of? What is this uh, pertaining to? What does this point us to? It points us to God's authoritative, revelatory, prophetic voice, his omnipotent voice, as it were. We don't have much to go on here because we're not told what the seven thunders say. <laughs> but what we do have to go on here is that this is God revealing something to his prophet, John. John heard these words. Who can but prophesy then? John certainly would have if John had not been hindered from writing down what they said. John said, I was about to write, but I heard then yet another voice, now a third voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. So this represents, as it were, essentially a fourth cycle. Again, another cycle, a fourth literary cycle, a cycle of sevens. Again, characterized by the number seven, which is that number seven, if you remember, is symbolic. Uh, were there seven thunders? I'm sure there were. But that number itself is symbolic. It step, stands for something. It represents something. It signifies something. What does the number seven signify in the book of Revelation? It signifies completion. Signifies perfection, if you will. And these seven thunders communicating intelligible speech and you would imagine, as we have looked at the other cycles of sevens, that these seven thunders also represent the same period of time that we're dealing with, the period from the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ to his second advent, and that being the completion of this age of the church, the completion of the church in her time of tribulation and suffering before God would bring a full end to sins, Daniel chapter 9, and bring an end to history, as it were, and usher in the eternal state. So it is a completed cycle, if you will, the seven thunders uttering their voices. And it's characterized by God's authoritative, revelatory, prophetic, omnipotent voice. Now, we also see thunder 
associated with God's prophetic voice, his revelatory voice at Sinai, as we just heard. It's an expression of his power. It's an expression of his authority to judge. God is judge of all the earth. He is just in pouring out judgments upon those who dwell upon the earth. There's an example of this uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 7. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, the Israelites were afraid of the Philistines. The Philistines were uh, at the precipice of, of overtaking Israel. And so the Israelites begged Samuel to not stop crying out to the Lord. Samuel, keep praying, praying that the Lord would deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Philistines. So Samuel prays there for Samuel 7, offers up a burnt offering to God. And verse 10 says this, now, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. Who overcome to them? Who overcame them? Who overcame them? Who overcame them? The Lord overcame them. How did he overcome them? He overcame them with his thunderous, omnipotent, loud, authoritative, revelatory, prophetic voices of a lion when it roars, speech, right? That's how the Lord overcame them. They were confused and overcome before Israel. As we continue through Revelation, we're going to continue to see thunder reminiscent of Sinai associated with God's judgments with God's power as he pours out judgment and ultimately final judgment upon those who dwell on the earth, upon unbelieving apostates. We're going to see that. We saw that in the cycle of seals. We, saw, we see that now in the cycle of trumpets. We're going to see that in the cycle of bowls. Each end, each of those cycles end with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in judgment and in power in judgment upon the wicked. And each of those cycles ends in peals of thunder representing God's authority, if you will, supreme authority to bring all that he has decreed to pass. Now, in Revelation 10, when the thunder had, thunders had uttered their speech, their authoritative, revelatory, prophetic content, presumably from God, verse four says that John was about to write when he hears another voice from heaven. The voice comes from heaven because that's the place where God is said to be enthroned. Right? We know that God is omnipresent, but can, there's continue ref, continual reference in the Bible to God being in heaven where God's throne is. We saw the throne room of God in heaven as the heavens were opened to John in Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 5. And that voice from heaven says to John, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. So before John could write, he's interrupted by this voice from heaven. And John is commanded to seal up those things which the seven thunders said. Now, how is it that John is to seal up what they said? He's not to write. Right? He's not to reveal that to us. So sealing and unsealing deals with revelation. And that, there's an example of that in Daniel chapter 12. I want you to turn there with me. Daniel chapter 12. Uh, there's an example of this that does have reference to our text in Revelation chapter 10. And this command, very similar command, is given to Daniel. And it's given to Daniel with respect to the prophecy of the end that Daniel himself was given. We can better understand what's being told to John by looking at what was told here to Daniel the prophet. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Right, this time of great tribulation. Even at that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. These are prophecies of the end that Daniel is now being made aware of. Verse two, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is speaking of the resurrection at the end of the age. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. That happens at the same time, by the way. There aren't multiple judgments. There's one judgment. And in that judgment, in that resurrection of the dead at the end of the age, some are going to rise to everlasting life. Some are going to rise to everlasting shame and contempt. Those who are wise at that time, verse 3, shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, what is Daniel told, verse 4? Shut up the words 
and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, it's this book, as we looked at before, that we think is opened, if you will, in Revelation by the Lord Jesus Christ as he takes the scroll out of the hand of him who sits on the throne. The Lord Jesus Christ begins to loose the seals and execute the judgments that are written upon the scroll. But in verse five, Daniel looked and there stood two others, one on this riverbank, one on the other. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We hear that language in Revelation chapter 10. That it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. Where do we hear that language? We hear that language in Daniel chapter 9, which is also a revelation of the end. That language for time, times, and half a time informs our understanding of the chronology, if you will, of the church age and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've talked about that reference before. Uh, That time, times, and half a time, one of those, the first half of Daniel's 70th week, pertaining to the first half, if you will, of the church age, there is a time that is represented by the second three and a half weeks, if you will, a time of great tribulation. We'll talk about that when we get there. But that is when the power of the holy people shall be completely shattered. All these things shall be finished. Verse eight, although I heard, Daniel said, I did not understand. And I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Well, the time of the end has come and we've seen those words unsealed, haven't we? Many shall be purified, made white and refined. How so? through the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Why? Because of the revelation of God through his spirit, (laughs) through his word. Verse 11, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Look forward at some point to going through Daniel with you. That's gonna be blessing. Verse 13, but you, Daniel, go your way until the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the age. So what are we to understand from these words to Daniel? One, the words are sealed up. They're to be sealed up. Daniel is commanded to seal them. That book, the book is sealed. That book that is sealed pertains to a time in the future. It doesn't pertain to Daniel's time. It pertains to the time of the future, the end times, those perilous times. They pertain to our times, right? The times in which we're living. Those are times and things that Daniel does not yet have to be concerned with. Daniel's going to die and he's going to rise to his inheritance at the end of the age. In other words, they are sealed up because they don't pertain to that age. They pertain to our age and they're sealed up until the appointed time And it isn't the appropriate time in Daniel's day to fully disclose them. They don't pertain to him. Secondly, that we're to take from this is Daniel doesn't understand them. Verse nine, he doesn't understand. Understanding, verse 10, will come later. The wise shall understand at that time. Now, if a parallel exists with what John experienced in Revelation chapter 10, then what are we to understand about the voice from heaven commanding John to seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered. If there is a comparison to be made, we should see the same kinds of things, but we don't. And that's very interesting. In Revelation chapter 10, John does understand. He's about to write it down. (laughs) He's about to write down what he heard. Rather than pertaining to some far off fulfillment, those thunders sound their voices before the outpouring or the sounding, the blast of the seventh trumpet. So if you understand the cycles and where we are in those cycles, that age, that period of history between the first and second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, then this is before the sounding of the seventh trumpet pertaining to that age, the age of the church. And this is when the thunders sound their, utter their voices, right? So this is something that John was prepared to write down because it does pertain to our age. These thunders 
sound their voices before the blast of the seventh trumpet. In Revelation 22, John is told not to seal up the prophecy. And why is he told not to seal up the prophecy? Because the time is at hand. The time has come for these things to be unsealed. So what are we to take from this with respect to the the sealing up, as it were, of the prophecy of those seven thunders? It isn't to be given to the churches. (laughs) The revelation that we have been given, that which John has been writing down, he's writing down what he sees, writing down what he hears, that's for the churches. All that we have in these cycles pertaining to this age, that's for the encouragement of the church, for the encouragement of God's people. It's for us to know. God has revealed these things to us. But in this particular case, this is something that we're not intended to know. (laughs) He's told to seal it up. We see key differences here, don't we, from that which was told to Daniel. In Revelation chapter 10, John is simply told, do not write, don't write it down. These words are not a part of this revelation, which is given to the churches. The content of what you just heard, John, is not to be communicated to the church. They could be given, and yet they're not given. What are we to take from it? It's a remarkable little section of text. What are we to take from that? There's not a lot that we can take from that. We've, we've heard much, haven't we? And we hear um, God's authoritative, omnipotent voice in all that's being said. But these are things that we are simply not told. And like Daniel, we're not always able to understand. We're not always able to understand. Look at John 16. And I think there's a comparison to be made here. John 16. The Lord is in the upper room with his disciples. In John 16, verse 12, the Lord says to his disciples, they're in the upper room together. They're with him face to face. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, verse 12, but you cannot bear them now. He has many things to say. I'm looking forward to get to heaven to hear what those things are. I'm sure there are things by this point, many of them we may know because revelation has been given. They can't understand them now because Jesus Christ has not been crucified. He has not been raised from the dead. We're standing on this side of that revelation and much of this has been given, right? But the Lord says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he's going to guide you into all this truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. The Lord knew that these things would be revealed later to them at a time when they could understand and through the ministry of his spirit, but not now, not in that room on the eve of his crucifixion. We're not told everything there is to know. We're told what we need to know. And that is abundantly gracious, abundantly gracious. God has been abundantly gracious, abundantly merciful with his revelation to us. We'll know these things when Christ returns. So what are we to take away from that then? Well, we need to labor to apprehend what we have been given. We need to labor to understand, to apprehend, to comprehend that revelation that has been given to us. There are things that we don't know, things that will be revealed later We need to understand the things that we can understand now. That is God's revealed word given to us. One thing we can be fairly sure of, these thundering voices are associated, like the other cycles, with the judgments and authority of God's voice, God's own voice, his revelatory, prophetic, authoritative voice. John chapter 12, verse 27, the Lord says, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this very purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So Jesus Christ says this, and then there's a voice that comes from heaven. It comes from the place where God himself is enthroned. Do you see? Therefore, verse 29, when the people who stood by heard it, they said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. They didn't get what was said. They couldn't make out what was said. What they heard was a thundering, booming voice. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. 
Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks. My soul is troubled. Father, glorify your name. God glorifies his own name with this, with this tremendous, booming, thundering, omnipotent voice, as it were, from heaven that the people around Jesus Christ didn't understand. They heard it thunder. Maybe it was the voice of an angel. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, this voice didn't come for my sake. It came for your sake, you people who don't understand. But what did you hear? You heard the booming voice of God at my declaration, as it were. The booming voice of God that is a revelation, if you will, of the righteous judgment of God upon this world and the ruler of this world being cast out and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners, right? That voice communicates even when we don't understand the speech that is being conveyed by the voice. Does that make sense? The voice communicates much. That voice is God's voice, his authoritative, supreme, revelatory, omnipotent, prophetic voice. They didn't originally understand. More revelation will come to your understanding in time. More revelation came to them after Christ was crucified, after he was raised from the dead. But suffice it for now, you're dealing with God. And God will bring it to your understanding in time. The thunders in Revelation 10 are for our sakes as well. And I think that's the way that we're to understand them. Scriptures, the scriptures tell us of them. All scripture is for our profit, <laughs> given by inspiration of God. So what are we to understand from their thunder? We're to understand that we're dealing with God. God is the one who is control. God is the one who is decreeing, executing his decrees from the, his throne in heaven. He is sovereign. He is authoritative. He is working all things after the counsel of his own will. And that voice is an indication that that's true. Not only is it a revelatory, authoritative voice, but it's backed up with omnipotent power saying that it is God himself who will bring all these things to pass. He'll reveal to us what we need to know in time. We are told all that we need to know. This humbles us, doesn't it? It humbles us. We are told all that we need to know. There are simply some things that it is best that we do not know. <laughs> God is determined in his infinite wisdom, it's best if we don't know those things. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. We need to be occupied with his preceptive will. His decretive will often revealed to us in time as we trust him in faith. It's often that we don't know his decretive will until we see it worked out in providence, right? But our responsibility is to concern ourselves with knowing, understanding, and obeying the preceptive will of God and trust him with the rest. We need to do what we've been commissioned to do, in other words. And our commission has been given to us. We are to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Those are our marching orders. That's our commission. God is taking care of everything else, working all things together for our good, preserving his church, encouraging his church. God is going to reveal what we need in time. He is the one who is taking care of us. We need to do what he has commanded us to do, amen? Whatever the case now, there can be no further delay. The end is nigh, as it were. Verse five, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven. He swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. That's a text we'll consider next time we're together if the Lord allows. Suffice it for now to say, the Lord God is omnipotent and our God reigns. Amen, amen. Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for all those things that you've revealed. And thank you in your infinite wisdom for those things that you do not reveal. As we're not, as those disciples in the upper room with our Lord, we're just not uh, capable of understanding all those things. You've revealed exactly what we need. Uh, you've revealed far more that we can comprehend or understand, Lord. We'll, we'll be plumbing the depths of Scripture for eternity, uh, and we're grateful 
to you for the things that you've revealed. We understand that we're often babes, not knowing our right hand from the left. And so, Lord, forgive us our ignorance, but we're grateful to you um, for the, the enlightenment that your spirit provides. We're grateful to you for your revelatory, prophetic voice that is given to us in the pages of Scripture. We're grateful for these words here in Revelation chapter 10. We're grateful for how they encourage your church. Lord, encourage us in our work. May we not grow weary or discouraged in well-doing, but may we look to him lest we become discouraged in our own souls. He who endured such hostility against himself at the hands of sinners and preserve us, Lord, protect us from discouragement, protect us from compromise. May we be faithful to your word for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the sake of your kingdom. We all pray all these things in his name. Amen.